Hello, everyone, and welcome to Forming First Collections. My name is Lara McCowie, and I'm the stage manager for this event. I'm pleased to welcome you to our 10th annual Wild Riders Literary Festival, which is brought to you by Wordsworth Books, the Balsili School of International Affairs, and the new quarterly literary magazine. Before we begin, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our festival donors and sponsors, including the Ontario Arts Council, the NAF Wealth Management Team of RBC Dominion Securities, and Audi Kitchener Waterloo. And now, I am pleased to introduce today's moderator, Carrie Snyder. Classic. <laughs> Thank you, Lara. <laughs> Good. Um, welcome everyone to the first fictions panel at Wild Writers Festival here in Waterloo. My name is Carrie Snyder and I'm joining you from Waterloo this evening where the sun has been shining all day and I only wish I could welcome you here in person. I'm honored to be moderating tonight's discussion on the short story, which is one of my personal favorite forms of fiction to read and to write, and one that Canadian writers are renowned for worldwide. So I'm going to begin by introducing each of our, our writers to you very briefly, and then we'll get a taste of their work read in their own voices followed by a conversation about the short story form and the writing process and how stories coalesce into collections or link collections or even novels. And we'll, we'll, we'll be trying to make this as conversational as possible and kind of roll with the flow as we go. So our writers will have an opportunity to pool their collective wisdom and we'll just see where we're led. Just so you know, we're gonna have time for a uh, Q&A at the end of the session. So I invite any questions and comments from the audience via the Q&A feature. I think the chat feature has been shut down, but uh, Laura will be checking in there um, if you are posting questions and you can really ask them at any time throughout the presentation. We look forward to hearing from you. So let me begin by introducing Katie Zadibble. I discovered Katie's writing when her story, The Last Thunderstorm Swim of the Season, was the winner of the New Quarterly's Peter Hinchcliffe Prize for Short Fiction, for which I was one of the adjudicators. I am so pleased to say that it's now the opening story in her debut collection, Equipoise, which was published this year. Katie has won accolades and recognition from a number of different sources, including a blurb by Joyce Carol Oates, and Katie joins us tonight from the Blue Mountain region of Ontario near Georgian Bay, where she's working on a new novel. Although I think she might be a little distracted at present because I happen to know that her family just got a new puppy this weekend. I don't know if we're gonna get any surprise, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, appearances by said puppy. Uh, moving on, Kate Cayley is an award-winning poet, playwright, young adult novelist and short story writer whose second collection of short fiction, Householders, was recently published and includes a story that was originally published in the new quarterly called Doc. Kate is joining us from Toronto where she lives with her wife and family and writes in the guest bedroom according to a TNQ online exclusive. And in another TNQ online exclusive, Kate, uh, you've written about how your stories take shape that they begin in a rush and then, and then move more slowly. And how this stuckness, as you said, has become a pattern that's now familiar and that you work with as you write, keeping multiple projects on the go at once. And perhaps we'll talk about this more this evening, about learning how to recognize and accept and work with rather than fight our own patterns of creation. And Shashi Bhatt, is an award-winning writer who has published several stories in the New Quarterly, including the title chapter of her second and most recent novel, The Most Precious Substance on Earth, which will also be published in the United States next spring. So congratulations on that, Shashi. Shashi is editor-in-chief of Event Literary Magazine and also teaches creative writing at Douglas College. And she's joining us from New Westminster, BC, where it looks like the sun 
is probably still shining. <laughs> You can actually see Shashi again here at the Wild Writers Festival um, on Wednesday evening when she's gonna be leading a craft workshop called Writing with Style. And Shashi is also working on a short story collection um, that will be published by McClelland and Stewart. So welcome to you all. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, okay, so you heard the order that you were introduced in. So now I'm gonna ask each of you to in turn read a short sample from your from your book and get just give us a taste of the wonderful and carefully crafted writing that readers will find inside these pages so we'll start with you Katie thank you very much Carrie <laughs> it was lovely to be introduced thank you um, I'm going to read from Honey Maiden, which is in the collection and I'm just going to start it's at, I'm going to read from the very beginning Honey Maiden. It is somewhere deep in the thick green and yellow part of Ontario where we stop for honey. The little farm store is tidily stacked with jars in varying shades of amber and blonde. There is a window white with noon sun and the honey absorbs the light, slowing it and thickening it into something that can be caught in a glass vessel. It is a moment in sepia, that golden brown overexposed light that belongs to rural Ontario in August belongs to honey and wheat and corn. A woman's voice calls from a back room to tell us she'll be with us soon. Her voice in my ear is also thick with light. My husband, David, and I wait, turning the jars over in our hands, gazing into the center of their goldenness, mesmerized. We finger and stroke the smooth tapered candles, the sweet smell of wax lulling us into an agrarian fantasy. I can tell that David isn't imagining us as beekeepers with netted headdresses and sturdy canvas suits. We've been roaming the countryside looking for a place, a farm, a town, a curvature of land to draw us in, let us settle. And while I've jabbered about almost every patch of farmer's fields we've glided past, David has been silent, even sullen up to this point. This is my Ontario, not his. The part where there is only cornfield, occasionally spliced by towns that consist of nothing more than two dirt roads passing through each other for a brief moment. A woman comes out from the back room, the fully expected farm girl in the flesh, complete with cheeks fuzzed and pert as peaches, brown eyes that seem to snap. She wears cut off jean shorts, hand with tidy straightness and a man's faded dress shirt rolled to the elbows. A pin at the pocket boasts, Verna County Fair gold medal honey 1991 last year. Attractive in an unembellished way, she's about my age. What can I do for you now? She asks in the local vernacular, but without the local twang. In fact, her words seem precise as though she's worked to clip the curved edges from them. David looks at her. Do you own this farm? His tone has an accusatory edge. She blinks. With my partner, yes. It's pretty. She stares straight at him and I know what she means by it. Only city people would call a farm pretty. Would you like to buy some honey? I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. So we'll go over to you now, Kate. Yeah, sorry. I'm um that was beautiful. Um and it caused me to get a little bit lost. Um thank you also for that introduction. So I'm gonna read briefly from the opening story of the collection and it's the opening of that first story which is called the crooked man so i don't think it i hope it doesn't need an, like it doesn't need much lead up all right uh the crooked man martha regarded herself skeptically and assumed skepticism from the other mothers at the table she had too many children four and not for a discernible reason religion twins she was too young 28 she was disordered and apologetic. She made stuffed baby toys out of felt and organic wool. Her breasts leaked through old tank tops. She was blonde, but not seductively so, freckled and angular, snub-nosed. A child, pinkish, pedaling a bike home from a violin lesson, earnest and a little sad. Her breasts were leaking. Denton was probably carrying their crying youngest through the house, cursing lavishly. I know this is going to be a difficult one, but we need to talk to the family, Bronwyn was saying, and ask them if they can route the car somewhere else or just have her walk to the car. 
Bronwyn paused, one hand tugging a handful of her long hair, thinking. They waited. That might be even better if the car was on a different street. We've got the chalk drawing on their street, and the lemonade, and the bake sale, and one of the bands, and Martha's craft table. They'll have to understand this is a community event. It's for the whole community. I'm sure they'll understand. But it's her wedding, Martha said, louder than she meant to. It's a shame, isn't it? It's her wedding. Bronwyn, Marley, and Allison looked at her, and she looked back at them over the table in Bronwyn's kitchen, and then down at her hands laid in front of her amidst the mugs of tea, the lists and phones and plates of cookies. Outside, she could hear Noah and Max playing. Martha smiled often as a cover for sleeplessness. Even though she felt the same watchful, aggrieved boredom as the other mothers, she was praised for her cheerfulness. The women surrounding her, on or beside park benches, in yards and community centers, at school pickups, on her street, calling greetings from the open windows of their cars or their open screen doors, appeared to her competent and discerning. Sure of their authority, not bewildered, as Martha was, by having to find enough mittens to go around, by remembering to bring sunscreen to the park. They complained freely, and their complaint seemed more justified than her own. She had not endangered a career or an artistic practice in order to raise children. Her memory before Noah's birth went as far as the first half of a degree in history. After, diapers, splatters of yogurt, little jars of fruit mush, tears, mysterious stains. The other woman se women seemed to her to have had more time to consider the question of what they wanted, and they had refined and elaborated on that question as if it was a problem that could be solved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Shashi. Thanks. Those were such good readings. Um, and thank you for the introduction, Carrie, as well. Uh, I'm going to read the opening of a story called Facsimile. I'm originally from Halifax. I type and then delete. Halifax born and raised. I type and then delete. I used to be a high school teacher, I type and then delete. It's 3.30 p.m. at Uncommon Grounds, my favorite coffee shop in Halifax because of how big the scones are. My laptop is open in front of me, a Dell Inspiron I just ordered on sale. With one hand, I'm crumbling my cheddar chive scone while with the other, I work on my dating profile. I wipe crumbs on a napkin before opening a photo in Photoshop. It's one of the few pictures I have of myself because usually I'm the one holding the camera. In this photo, I'm standing on the Halifax waterfront, smiling blandly. A tall ship casts a shadow over me, its spars decorated with festive multicolored pennant garlands. I search online for an image of a shark, extract it from its background and paste it onto my photo. Then I clone stamp and blur and filter until the shark looks like it's really there eager jawed in daylight, leaping over my head towards the ship. This will be my profile picture. My hopes are that it will make people laugh and that it will start conversations so that I don't have to. I get up, toss my napkin in the compost, put my empty plate in the bin for used dishes and head to the washroom. When I return to my table, my laptop is gone. As a Haligonian, I trust other Haligonians. Maybe not every Haligonian, but Haligonians as a group. Halifax is a city where everybody's on a first name basis with Glenn the busker who plays the accordion from his electric wheelchair on a corner of Spring Garden Road. Where folks wave back at the Harbor Hopper, the amphibious tourist vehicle full of Americans on a cruise ship's excursion. Where a city bus driver strums a ukulele to entertain passengers at long red lights. Where Global News featured a story about masked men wandering the city performing random acts of kindness. I always thought Haligonians would watch my stuff when I went to the washroom. Thank you so much. And I remember reading that and thinking, oh no, <laughs> that's like <laughs> writer's worst nightmare. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's jump right in with some questions. So my questions are going to be fairly general but I also would like to take the opportunity to highlight each of your books. So I prepared a question for everyone that 
kind of springs directly from something that was sparked in me by, by, by each of your books. So I'll start by directing a question to one of you and then invite everyone to reflect on that question too. So I'm going to start with Katie, but this question is, is also for both of you, Kate and Shashi as well. Katie Zdibel, in your short story collection, Equipoise, the characters in each story are distinctive and unique. These are standalone stories, kind of in the, the classic way that we think of a short story collection, where maybe it's more up to the readers to try to make the links or figure out what the, what the thematic links are or stylistic links and kind of reflect on how they operate as a whole. So one thing that I felt like I noticed was of dislocation and of characters who are trying and often struggling to put down roots in new places, perhaps as an opportunity to reinvent themselves. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, was there a point in the writing process when you recognized that you were working on a collection rather than on individual stories? And did you have kind of a thematic connection in mind when it came time to pull the stories together and unify them? Um, not until the very end, not until I wrote the very last story. And I wasn't really intending to write a collection. I, I had not written short stories before the stories in this collection. I started them about eight years ago and I was living in a white horse at the time and had joined a writer's group. And I, I am really bad at, um, structure and like creating a continuous arc. So I thought that it would be a really good personal challenge to always try and submit a short story to this writing group so that every time I was workshopped, I was getting feedback on like a complete arc. And then like a few years into that, I realized that I had a lot of short stories, but I it kind of surprised me a little bit <laughs> because I hadn't thought of writing short stories or writing a collection. I, I often would start pieces and not finish them, but assume that they could eventually become novels or I wrote articles and sometimes poetry. Um, but I really love, love short stories and fell in love with writing them. And I think partially because it is so hard for me to, to create a whole story with a satisfying shape and such a small block of text. And I really like that challenge. Um, but I, I really just wrote about 10 short stories and the 10th one was the title story Equipoise. And I had a weird moment where I wrote that word Equipoise into the story. And I had this like mental image of um, like balancing two energies within oneself. So like a potential version of yourself versus another potential version of yourself. And one might take shape more readily in a particular landscape and the other might take shape in a different kind of polar landscape. And I thought about how that was very true for me at the time, but also for my characters. So I don't think this is a normal way to come to the theme or to create a collection of stories, but I really had this moment where it was like, I had this puzzle piece and I put it in and I was like, oh, they, they are all, they connect. Like this could work as a collection and I have 10. That seems like maybe enough for a collection because my stories run long. So it was a, it was a strange, moment um, that I remember really clearly, like where I was sitting at my kitchen table and writing this, that, that last story, Equipoise. Yeah, I don't think there's probably one exact way to put together a collection, which is why this is such an interesting conversation. So I want to ask um, either Kate or Shashi, if you'd like to jump in um, and just let us know what your process was and when you knew you'd arrived at what has been published. Published. Sure, I can jump in because my experience seems like it was the exact opposite of Katie's. Um, I think my ideas come in the size and shape of short stories, and I always think everything I write is going to be a short story, and then it's usually someone else who suggests that it should be a novel. Um, and with this book, like now it's, I guess, uh, I think of it as a novel in stories, 
but it did originally intend to be a short story collection. And it started out as just one short story that I wrote because I had to give a reading at a bar in grad school. And all the stories I was writing for my MFA classes were very serious, descriptive stories, but I didn't think they would go over well as like a public reading, mostly because the audience was our like 19 year old pre-med students who didn't write or read fiction. And I just, you know, so I intentionally wrote this voice that was like young and accessible and used a bunch of pop culture references and jokes but then I knew that at some point I wanted it to have a shift or like to turn towards something dark and uncomfortably real. Um, and that became the first chapter or story of this book. And then I just really liked that pattern for a story. Uh, I had never written in a voice like that before. And I liked the ability to, to play with tone and emotional range. Um, so I wrote a bunch of stories. They all happen to be like first person, present tense stories circling around the theme of a woman's silence. And then I eventually I just kind of was like, oh, these are all the same woman. Let's call it a novel. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I really sorry. I really love that. The idea of like writing something for this very particular audience. That's great. Um, I feel like for this collection, it had a weird trajectory because I had published a first collection and then had the feeling that what a real writer does is then write a novel. So I tried writing a novel for four years. Um, and and I, I did love that novel, but it, it never quite worked. And I, you know, love like I, I loved it a lot. Like sometimes I, I feel the sadness for it. And realizing that the novel wasn't working and partly to procrastinate I kept writing short stories and then realized that I had a collection and then uh, actually after the collection had been accepted by the publisher started taking out pieces of the novel and making them into short stories so what started out as an unlinked collection actually kind of ended up as a semi-linked one um, which was great because I don't I, I, I strongly identify with not being good at structure, like, and I don't even quite know what structure is. I, I was just reading something by this American short story writer who's quite celebrated and he said very confidently that like a short story breaks down as three sections of three parts each and he had it all sort of graphed. And I had a moment of thinking, oh, should I be doing that? And I was like, I have no idea how. So I like the way that short stories you can kind of play with structure play with not quite knowing what you're doing and um I mean something I find amazing about putting together a collection is that each story in the collection has a couple of ghosts behind it like early versions and then also stories that you took out and threw away because they weren't working so um my collection came about partly like through the ghosts of this novel yeah Oh, that's really fascinating, Kate. Um, and I'm directing my next question to you. And it's kind of interesting because it's, uh, yeah, it, it's about revising. And I, um, so, okay, let me do a proper <laughs> question. <laughs> Kate Cayley, your short story collection, Householders, contains characters linked through their connections, like you were saying. And, Sometimes the connections are quite distant um, and the connections are to a kind of quasi religious cult that spurns technology and the, they try to live off the land. Um, but the stories are unique and they stand on their own. But there are story uh, characters that recur and I found myself kind of looking for them, you know, as one does in a linked collection. Um, but not all the linkages were so obvious or easy to identify and I'm not even sure if they necessarily were quite all linked. Uh, I did my best to try and figure it out. It was like a little puzzle, trying to put together a puzzle. Um, but I think they were definitely stylistically linked, um, that they had a, that there was a kind of a tone to the stories that, that holds them together as well. So again, this is a question for everyone, but starting with you, Kate. Um, when forming a unified collection, what role did editing and revision play in your process? I noticed that in the acknowledgements, you said, that you were working on revisions at the start of the pandemic. So I also thought maybe that had, had come into play. Um, 
so yeah, just talking about revision. Well, that was an interesting one because the final story in the collection actually is a pandemic story, but it had been the concluding chapter of the novel that I'd rejected, which was uh, which I which I had put aside in 2019, and then as the pandemic hit, my wife suddenly said, "Why don't you take out? Why don't you take that final chapter and actually rework it so that it's happening?" during COVID because everything that's happening in it is so much more pressing now, sort of in, the, I mean, it was always pressing, that's a silly thing to say, but kind of in the question of like, what do we owe to our elders and to their free will and how they might wish to, to, to finish their lives. Um, that's a whole other conversation about um, what the last two years have been, but oh boy, revision. Um, a lot of the connections did come out through revision especially because the idea of having each story explicitly, even if it was like very tangentially linked, came about through the editing process. And I love editing. Like right now I'm trying to work on, and I love working with editors. It's the most wonderful thing. Um, like right now I'm starting something new in that way that you're like flying a plane blindfolded and you don't know if it's any good and there's no one to tell you. And the thing about this kind of like very rigorous process of editing and revision is you get to, you get to actually get to a point where you're happy with your work. <laughs> and in the early, at the beginning of it, you never are. And so much of it isn't there. It's like, you're like hacking at a large piece of stone and you don't have the sculpture yet. Sorry, I feel like I'm not really answering this question. Um, but I often think revision is when the story actually comes about that what you had before was the like the nub of the story and it's through that process of someone challenging you and saying I don't understand what this means um that you start to realize what you did mean all, all along yeah so I hope that's I hope that's sort of a semi-answer no that's fabulous and that visual that you created there for us of like uh, the sculpture yet to be discovered um yeah that just jumped into my brain really mm -hmm. clearly um, Shashi or Katie, do you want to talk about revision, revision or editing for your collections? Katie, yes, go ahead. I was saying she could go ahead, but that's okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I didn't do any revising in terms of bringing the collection together as a whole. And actually, that didn't really occur to me. I think that once I had completed the stories, I realized that they were representative of a theme of um, balance that worked in that time of my life. Like that, I was really focused on where to live and how to live and how to be. And that just kept coming out in my stories um, as well as like being between roles because I had my kids during the time that I, I wrote, like my kids are small and my first was born basically when I started writing this collection. So it was like just happening that they had a, a collective theme, but I, I too love revision a lot. And I read an article, which I should be able to say who wrote it, but um, maybe I can put it up in the notes after, but I really started to love revision after I read this article about how um, when you write your first draft or couple of first drafts, you then like go in as the reader to try and decode what the story is telling you. And the question that the article poses is what is the story that your story is trying to tell you? And I love that moment where I've written something and who knows where it is coming from. I had a small grain of an idea and I started and then people arose and things happened. And then I have about 20 pages I seem to write in 20 page blocks and then I go back and I think what is going on here what is why did I write this and what is it what's the urgency here like what is it that I really want to get at and that's it's hard to uncover that but it's so interesting to me it's like detective work and you know part of me always wanted to be a detective when I was little I was like definitely be a writer but detective on the side would be really great <laughs> because you get to put all these clues together so i love that with with stories and other people's stories too but in your own you 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 have that satisfying moment of like oh i i didn't realize i was tapping into this 
issue, this unresolved issue or this question I have, or, you know, things just suddenly become clear after you really dig into that revision process. So I enjoyed revising so much one story after another. Um, but yeah, that was my process for that. There was no, there was no sort of looking at the whole and being like, okay, and now how do I make this collection? I was just like, these are my 10 stories. So here they're together. And I actually think they kind of work together. So I'll just go with it. And I'm glad that worked out. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And that's valid because you're talking about how they belong to that time in your life. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shashi, over to you. Yeah, revising I also love, I love revising. Um, I revise pretty drastically when I'm like, even before I'm working with an editor, I like doing things like, uh, like color coding my manuscript with highlighter and cutting it into pieces and laying it out on the floor and rearranging. I just, I find it fun to kind of like drop it on the ground and let it break and then put it back together and see what happens. Um, and once I started working with my editor, I think, um, I, I mean, I think she's a genius. My editor is Anita Chong, and I just love talking to her. Like, I can have revised a story 20 times, and then I show it to her, and she notices something that I just never thought of. Um, and we would have these three or four hour phone calls at a time. Um, and she'd be like, prepare yourself with water and snacks and like, all of that. But um, it's funny because it was never a drastic revision, but she just pays such attention to like every line and every word. And um, I guess when I was revising on my own, I was still thinking of them, the chapters or stories as stories. Whereas when I started working with Anita, it was like we were moving it more towards being a novel. So a lot of the edits I made then were kind of like strengthening the spine of the book or creating mini character arcs because I would have characters who kind of appeared and then like maybe reappeared, but they didn't have their own arcs. And um, like my book is about a woman, like people keep calling it a coming of age story. I don't know if it is like to me, I don't think it's a woman finding herself so much as a woman losing herself. Um, and once I knew that, and then I started shaping like mini arcs within the book, um, I started thinking about like, how do these other characters arcs parallel hers and like she's a best friend for example and I think her arc is almost like a kind of like a parallel echo of the main characters arc uh, so yeah a lot of the revision was just trying to um like reframe it as a novel for myself okay well that that leads us really nicely into my next question which is for you Shashi um and it's about your novel. And I, I asked, do you want it to be called a novel, a novel in stories? It's, it's um, you could read it either way, I think. Like I did question, should I be calling these chapters or stories when uh, for this uh, purpose? But I think either works actually. Um, anyway, your novel, The Most Precious Substance on Earth delves into the storytelling opportunities offered by different mediums and technologies. As your narrator needs, who loves books but also loves watching TV. She moves from interacting in an early internet chat room as a grade nine student to meeting her blog's troll as a, an adult aspiring writer. And it seemed to me that you were exploring these different means of communicating, of reaching out to the world, like ways for characters to tell their stories and write their fictions and to share them in a public forum one way or another. Like there were Toastmaster speeches, there's Facebook, there are, you know, poems written in high school, creative writing class. So again, this question is for everyone, but I'm going to start with you, Shashi. Reading your novel got me thinking about why we persist in communicating through this old fashioned medium, specifically books. These long strings of words printed on paper, bound and then distributed technology that was developed in the 15th century like what is the endurance of the printed word and maybe also a fiction and what draws you to writing books in particular yeah that's such a good question because <laughs> i feel like like the reason i write is just because i can't not write um 
And like, I'm also, I mean, I admit I watch a lot of TV. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I do all of those other things, but I can't imagine myself creating a podcast or creating a TV show. I think like nothing makes me happier than writing. Um, and like, like I love the feeling of being immersed in a story, like where you're walking around and everything in your day could potentially become like could enter your story and become a part of it. And just like seeing the world through that lens. Um, I don't know if like, I don't know if that's how podcasters think or TV writers think too. But for me, all of those thoughts I have just kind of seem to like um, direct themselves into fiction. Yeah, I am. Um, I, sorry, are you, Shashi, are you? Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, Lana, it's so hard with this online thing. Um, sometimes I feel like I don't have a good answer to why write books, because I don't know, I even, uh, our, like, our experience is so mediated now, though maybe I hope that's why. Like, I like the idea of being, of using this ridiculous, ob semi-obsolete, technology that does actually unite you with like you know a couple of thousand years of history um in terms of how people like obviously books originally were also themselves a technology and like I've read fascinating things about the hysteria around the popularization of the printing press that it would be too easy too many people would be literate oh my goodness it's all gonna fall apart and then it sort of didn't which um makes like cheers me up around like my own hysteria around like how online and mediated and fragmented and just like my attention is shot um but there is a, like a stillness to books and a and a like a length to them and a feeling that you are actually communicating in a traceless way because everything else is leaving a trace now like this weird like long tail of everything you've ever said or done and it's like semi-monitored in all kinds of strange ways and the idea of this like I don't actually know who's reading the book I mean I guess I could have a sales record but even that wouldn't tell me very much and I don't even know then if they've read it it's not like you get the notification saying they actually read it um and I love that the intimacy of that and the mystery of that and also I remember thinking, I, I think a lot about how I'm like irrevocably a 20th century person, even though assuming and hoping I live a long life, like almost all of my life will actually have been lived like in, in the 21st century. And yet I still feel like sort of aligned, like wistfully aligned to the, to the, to the 20th century. So that's not really an answer either. Um, but I want the book to endure, I guess. And I think, I kind of think it will we've had too much time with it for it not to. Yeah. Yeah, I hope it endures too. I, I love books and I, I don't know, it doesn't make sense that we still love them as much as we do. If we look at it in terms of like how society operates now and, and how we, how we communicate online so much it, it doesn't really fit but it still resonates and I'm not sure if we can totally understand why I feel like there's a, a bit of a magical process that happens when you're holding a book and you're reading it as well as when you're writing it I think I think I'm drawn to write fiction because it's so much more truthful to my experience than nonfiction. And I've, I've written for magazines and I'm actually working on a nonfiction manuscript right now, which is really painful for me. <laughs> I'll never do it again because fiction, I feel like you're able to shape what can't be seen with your words in a way that is, um, to me feels, like the most honest way to live, to express how life feels. And it's not direct, you know, like poetry would be maybe even more honest. It's so indirect, but bang on to the experience in a way that I don't think would come across the same in like 
Twitter or, you know, other forms of online communication, there's something about, like Kate said, the slowness of the book, but also the physical it's paper and it's like old and ancient feeling. And we go way back with the book. But I think that's sort of imprinted somewhere in our, in our memory that something happens when you like physically hold these bound papers and you you engage with that in a different way and i think we do also engage with fiction in a different way than nonfiction. although some nonfiction is quite beautiful and poetic but um yeah just just the the way that yeah I, i'm trying to avoid saying the word magic again but i do feel like it's a magical experience you can't quite I can't articulate it, but I just know that some sort of like alchemy occurs. And sorry, can I add onto that just one sentence? I'll try to make it one sentence. I actually feel like there's something in like the rhythm of sentences that makes you very aware of the reality of other people, mm -hmm. like in a way that you're like, you're really getting into the consciousness of someone else. Like, mm -hmm in a way that sometimes I like have this like despairing sense that that happens to me more as a reader than it does in my life. Mm -hmm. And that feels like something that books do in a way that a lot of other more like technologically aligned forms of writing don't, don't do quite as well. Mm -hmm. That you have to like breathe and stop and settle in to like the strange rhythm of someone of someone else. Like it's like the, the, the thing that makes it okay that you only get to be one person. Yeah, life. like you have this form where you take a break from that in a way that's not superficial. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a bit redundant, but there you go. No, and I'll, I'm just going to add one more thing to that is like a, a favorite book that you read over and over again, you have this like relationship with the book that you, you know, it's dog eared in places that are familiar to you and it's like stained in places that are familiar and it's faded and um, you know, I have certain books that I read over and over again, and they it, that wouldn't happen if it was like just disappearing as soon as I close my computer. Like I've got to hold it and fall asleep with it on my bedside table and like wake up to it there. And it's just like has a physical presence in my life. And that character that I've connected with is is there. It's is in my room, is in my life with me. And like I think that something that frustrates me with online technology is. I can't hold it. I can't grab it. And I feel like it's gone once I can't see the words in front of me. It just slips away. Um, do we have time to ask my fellow pa panelists a question? Because I just genuinely want to know. Are we out of time? We have like kind of a minute before the Q&A is going to start, but I'd love to hear what your question I just, is. So I, I, I want to go ahead. For go both ahead. Of you, do, do you write longhand or on the computer? How do you do it? Yeah. I, I do both, but mostly on the computer, but I do print out a lot. If I'm really like getting into it, then that's when I print it out. I make notes by hand, but I write on the computer. Yeah. Thank you. Just want to. <laughs> Me too. And did you say what you do, Kate? Oh. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, I, wish, I wish I could write by hand. I feel like I've lost the ability to actually. Um, <laughs> Sometimes I have this dream where I'll like I'll like train my brain to do it again, but it um it does flow better on the computer now. So I'm just mm. occasionally I'll meet someone who says that they do actually draft in longhand, and I'm always curious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I do a bit of both, but I find that my hand gets tired. But it it is it's worth trying. I feel like it taps into something else that you can't get at when you're just typing. Oh, totally. Yeah. Okay, so Q&A time. And I'll just kind of read through and see what we've got. So uh, Candace, uh, Cadence, sorry, Cadence says, loving the panel so far. Katie, what was the biggest thing you learned about structure by focusing on short stories? And Cadence says, she's happy to hear from Shashi and Kate too. So what was the biggest thing you learned about structure by focusing on short stories? I think just that, that I had to come to a satisfying ending so that I, uh, it had to have a feeling. It had to, the ending had to 
create a feeling in me that um, I wasn't aware of what that feeling might feel like before I started these stories. I would just write, I would just write pieces of things and, and then kind of they would fade off. Um, but I think the first time I wrote an ending, it was like, you know, this like inner sort of like sound wave. It was like, and I was like, oh, it's done. It's done. And it's only done because I built to it in a way that it can create that sound and echo at the end. If you don't build to it properly, it just falls flat when you get there. And the ending doesn't really present itself to you. I mean, I feel like once I have the ending and the title, I really have the story. I like titles. They're kind of like a riddle and I can't get to the title until the ending is like really, um, yeah, producing in me this feeling of like, ah, it's, it's like this release for the character. So nothing, nothing about like form. Like I read different books on form of structure and I really, I can't get into that. I can't get excited about it, but I can get really excited about like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. The feeling is increasing and it's, it's changing in this way. And it's going to take this turn that I didn't expect. And then it's going to come around and this character is going to have this moment where I know I can go now. And I, it's like they're at their, they reach some point of like beauty or, catharsis or epiphany and and that's it and get out fast and then get get away from them well it's interesting because there's another question here also about structure it's from amy um and she says i love kate's comment about not always understanding structure it's not just me <laughs> um, i'm wondering about your thoughts on structuring a story through feeling or instinct an enjoyment of the flow of the story rather than following a pattern so kate do you want to answer that yeah, um, it's an ambivalent answer because right now I feel like I've been going on, I, there's something I'm working on right now that I feel like I've been going on flow and instinct for many, many, many pages and I'm going to need to actually figure out a structure at some point because it's starting to feel self-indulgent. But um, I don't know, I, 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 it's very hard to answer these questions without sounding a little bit abstract or sentimental, but I do think that there is such a thing as... As, as working on hunches and like working on hunches, working on the, the feeling. And I sometimes think like, like, like the guy with the breakdown of the nine parts, um, I admire that, but I can't work in it. And sometimes when I try to make pronouncements about structure, I feel like I'm lying in order to make what I do sound more legitimate. Than, than it is because you're making up shit it's like it's not it's not very legitimate um or it, or it is but to something else so I think most of the time I'm working on hunches or working on like that first paragraph where you had the idea but then past that the story kind of takes on its own life and something will surprise you you discover that a character has a dead child or is divorced like something that you yourself did not know and you think oh that's funny I didn't I didn't expect that and yet it happened and sometimes it happens in the space of a sentence and then that starts to dictate your structure yeah so I don't I don't know does someone else want to jump in please well actually we have a bunch of questions Ooh, and we're probably okay. going to run out of time so um this one I think sounds like a good one for you Shashi to answer it's from Natalia and she's wondering, do you think are, uh, there are telltale signs that a short story should become a novel instead? <laughs> oh, well, for me, it was um, like I had all of these stories and was thinking about making a collection. And then like some of them were really similar in like point of view, voice and theme. And then there were a couple of weird outliers that were like vaguely speculative or in like omniscient third or second person or whatever. And like, I think the only reason it became a novel was because so many of the stories were so similar that if I had made it into a short story collection, it would have been too homogenous. Um, yeah. Actually, that's a really interesting observation, maybe about the distinction between a novel and a short story collection, is that in a sense, a short story collection can't be same story over and over and over again. Yeah. And <laughs> now that, that I'm a novel kind of is. 
But now I'm working on a, a, a short story collection that's not linked and not going to be a novel. And like, that's something I'm really thinking of is how to balance like point of view and theme and different ages and genders of narrators and different, like, I don't want it to feel all the same. And I'm, I'm finding that really challenging actually. It's and, and figuring out how to put them in order is a whole other challenge. <laughs> okay. So I know there are um, writers out there who have questions for you specific to publishing. So this is from Megan or Megan for everyone. How many of the short stories in your collections were previously published in literary magazines or won awards? How many of the stories in your collections were new content? And is there a golden ratio according to agents and publishers? So it's kind of a three-part question. Does, does anyone want to jump in? I think we'll have to be pretty brief with this one, but um, Kate? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, in this current collection, only three had been published before the collection was accepted for publication. I already had an agent who had very patiently gone through so many drafts over four years of the novel that then no one published. So she was already there. Um, one had won an award and I don't, uh, and not much was very new by the time the collection was put together. Mo there, there were, um, much of it was material that was like heavily reworked, but it was all several years old. Yeah. Uh, Katie, you're nodding, do you? Oh, uh, yeah, I had, I think five were published, five or six in different literary magazines. Um, a, a couple award winners, a couple shortlisted, a couple nominated um, and then the collection itself like as soon as I finished that last story I sent it to the HarperCollins UBC prize contest and the collection was shortlisted for that so then from there it went to my publisher so nothing new was added after that I don't know if there's a golden number I feel like I get different numbers told to me so I don't know <laughs> Yeah, mine was, I think it looks like about eight of them were published previously in a 13 chapters. Um, and then a couple were like awards or shortlisted or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a number either. No, it's probably a, a bit more of a, like it, there's not like a formula. If, a, if an editor loves your writing, then they'll take a leap. Probably that's, you need the editor to, really connect with your work. That's kind of where the, the magical thing happens. Like you were talking about Kate, how much you love your editor. Um, and I think Shashi as well. And like working with an editor who's, who's accepted your book is, is like, a, it's a real gift because you know they're advocating for you, they're on your side and they're really engaged with, with your writing because it's clicked with them. So yeah, that's probably the more important thing. Um, okay, does this end right at eight? Do we have, do we have a few more minutes? So uh, someone has asked if, if we could, if you could all recommend one short story collection as a must read, what would it be? <laughs> Just gonna spring it on you guys. <laughs> Any thoughts? Does anything jump to mind? So hard to pick one. <laughs> That'd be really hard. <laughs> Okay, what's what's um, one that you would just love to recommend? Oh, um, oh, sorry, Shashi, sorry, I cut you off. Oh no, mine is just Danielle Evans' "Before You Suffocate Your Own Fool Self." Her other her other collection is really great too. But oh, I love yeah, I'm, I'm I'm reading her other collection right now, and she is she is so so good. She's phenomenal. Anyway, sorry, but oh. Um, Anything by Alice Munro, there's a Tessa Hadley novel called Clever Girl that's not actually a novel. Like if you read it, it is connected short stories that has the feeling of a novel. And that's the one I recommend all the time because you're like, how are you doing this? These are connected short stories, but it feels propulsive. Yeah, those would be two. I've got three right here in my desk. So I'm just gonna show them Lauren <laughs> Croft, Florida. So good. Um, Monkeys. Susan Minot, which is kind of like a novel and short stories and anything Alice Monroe, but um, I love Who Do You Think You Are. Mm -hmm. 
but definitely okay I'll those are that. yeah i know i feel like we can't do a short story panel <laughs> as canadian oh, writers me, me. Without, without... great anything anything by ian lee all of ian lee's short story collections can you um, spell all that ian lee, ian lee? how's um, that Y I Y N and Lee is L I, and she is a genius. She's, she's oh yeah, a, yeah yeah I love her very very much. Um, like she like feels like an accompaniment through my life. I've never met her, um, but anyway, yeah, any uh, any of her short stories, but they're very. Sad. I'm also a George Saunders fan. Tenth oh, yeah. of December. <laughs> Yeah, it's also great to read anthologies like Best American Short Stories because you'll get introduced to a bunch of different writers and um, like the Journey J Journey Prize compilation in Canada, you'll you'll read a bunch of different short stories and you'll fall in love with like two and then you'll start seeking out their collections mm -hmm. for more. <laughs> okay, I am not sure if we actually have time for one more, so I'm. I'm trying to see if there's one that would be particularly quick to answer. Uh, what do you think are the qualities of the strongest short story collections? It's kind of as a whole, not individual story. So maybe even just thinking of those books that we were just talking about, like what is it about them? I think every single one has to be really, really good. You can't have any weak spots. The ones that stand out are like, oh my gosh, I got through that whole book and every single one just really, really was striking and, and amazing to me. Yeah, and to dazzle in a slightly different way, I find really impressive too. Mm -hmm. um, I love mm -hmm. feeling like even the minor characters are like given some kind of form and reality, uh, which is really hard to do because this story this form so elusive and you have to do it so quickly so lightly it's like a, it's like sketching um but when I finish a short story collection I feel like I could imagine the story from the perspective of a different character not the one who was telling it like that can feel mm -hmm. pretty amazing mm -hmm. oh those are all great reasons <laughs> <laughs> um I think we've almost answered them all uh, there's a question about endings from Amy. Um, how do we know when we found a good ending for a panel? <laughs> no, how do you know when you found a good ending for your, <laughs> for your short story rather than just stopped writing it? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. My answer is if Last an ending, minute. if it makes me cry and if I'm playing it over and over in my own head. <laughs> That to me is a good ending. Yeah, uh, the feeling that something has opened instead of closed. Um, I don't, but that's not something I've, I'm ever able to define, except I know when I'm doing it and it's not working. When <laughs> you're like, no, this feels like like something landed with a thud. Um, and, oh, there's a thing of Marianne Moore's, the poet about the ending of poems where she talks about false epiphany um false epiphany and do you get it as two endings to avoid one is the like epiphany you haven't earned and the other one is the sum up um but she doesn't say what the right ending is just the things to avoid and i, I like that i also like to like carry around not to, to try not to do either of those things oh laura's back welcome back laura Should we end on the note of the, the ending that opens rather than closes and hope that you all go off into your evenings with your minds opened and thinking about short stories and, and thinking about why you love them so much. Um, and I yeah, thank, thank you all for this conversation. And I just wanna say it's such a pleasure to get to ask the questions that I want answers to. to. <laughs> and to hear, hear you talk about your thoughts and ideas um, because I love books and I love writing and, and that's what this is all about. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody out there. Me. Yeah. Okay, take care. Thank you so much, all of you. This has been a lovely talk to listen to and honestly, just wonderful hearing you converse and talk about writing in all its different uh, manners. 
Um, in closing, I want to remind our viewers that um, all the writers' books are available for purchase online from Wordsworth Books. Visit our online book table for a handy overview of all our festival authors' books. Don't forget the next World Writers Literary Festival event is tomorrow, titled Making a Living as a Writer at 7 p.m. Thank you so much for attending today's session. <laughs> right. Right. Good night.